This is our planet radio. It is uh, February the 27th, 2012, and uh, we are in a brand new studio, and so we're still getting the bugs out of it. The sound may be a little different. Um, Some people are having streaming problems as well. We're looking into that. Hopefully, if you're listening, well, if you're listening, you've got the stream, and I welcome you to the show tonight. My guest will be coming on in a few minutes. Joe Datoma will be here. We're going to talk about the cult of the Black Sun and the rising of the Black Sun because um, <clears throat> a lot of things that have been woven into what's called the conspiracy realm are now beginning to come true. We're beginning to see the whole thing unravel. And so uh, it's a very interesting time to watch, and most of us are not at the sidelines anymore. Most of us are in the heat of battle. A couple of things I want to talk about uh, regarding last week's show with George Cavasilis. And one cl- clarification I want to make uh, straight up front. In the course of the interview, we talked a little bit about the One People's um, Public Trust. And I may have given the impression that I'm not in favor of this. Um, I've actually followed it for quite a while now. And the information that they're putting out and what they're doing is interesting. I had reservations about it. Because in the initial work that they were doing, they were using UCC filings. But as I understand that this week, based on their current information, they're saying it is no longer necessary for anybody to use UCC filings to implement the OPPT uh, procedures. And there are new, um, there's new paperwork being released. This is actually pretty good work. I've been familiar with UCC process going back into the 90s. following people like Winston Shroud, Victoria Joy, and others. And at that time, a lot of people, well, this was the time of the Montana Freeman, too, so there were a lot of people who went to prison as a result of this. That was my um, basic concern about what OPPT was doing. But I, I think it's valuable work, and I think they spiritually have it pretty much right. So... Um, we leave that with you to your discernment. This is not about leaders. This is about you sifting through information. I like to say uh, chew hard, swallow, uh, and throw out the bones. The other side of this was I was contacted by Jason, who is uh, George's producer, on the Dolores Cannon issue. And some of you will notice that George sort of sidestepped that, and, well, he should have. That was not a trap. I was simply pointing out to him as uh, part of the interview that Dolores Cannon, in many ways, her information contradicts what George is doing. So we fairly agree on that process. That said, I'm not against Dolores Cannon. I just think some of the information she brings out um, needs to be weighed and sifted a little bit. Anybody that's telling you that... uh, Humanity is fleas on the back of Mother Earth is receiving tainted information. So um, that kind of gets it where it's going. The other thing that's been floating around again is this idea that the Internet's going to go down. you got to remember something about the Internet, folks. It was built by them to withstand atomic blasts. Um, would a solar event take out the Internet? Well, it would on at least one hemisphere, perhaps. But um, the Internet 
has morphed. It's become a tool of the people, too. So you want to keep your thoughts and your intentions directed towards keeping the system going and avoiding catastrophic events as well. Having said all that, I want to bring my guest up. Um, I've been privileged to talk with him a few times at length, and um, I I find this book that he wrote, and this is uh, going back to 2010, The Cult of the Black Sun. It's a work of fiction, but it weaves within it what I'll just say is a mother load of conspiracy theories. And uh, with no more further ado, Joe DeToma, welcome to Off Planet Radio. Thank you very much, Randy. Glad to be here. Good to have you on tonight. Um, tell us a little bit. This book, and you and I have talked a little bit, this book is kind of the um, product of your own, I guess, <laughs> kind of coming to the realization that things don't work quite the way we were told and yet you and I talked about this we've always known this but it was like certain events galvanize our understanding tell us how the book came about tell us how you came to wake up to what was really going on in the system well I think I was actually born to it in that um, I grew up in a household my father was a member of an organization called the Alhambra which is like a sect inside the Knights of Columbus <clears throat> Knights of Columbus is a very connected uh, organization, as you probably know. Mm-hmm. And um, this is a small part of it. It's so small that most knights have never heard of it. You have to be a fourth-degree knight to be in it. And um, it's a very interesting organization. It's very similar in the setup to Shriners. And while Catholics probably would poo-poo the point that the knights are similar to the Masons, it's, mm-hmm. the, the setups are similar. Yes. Uh, the verbiage might be a little different, but I think the belief systems kind of collide a little here and there uh, before they go in and out of each other. Um, he died when I was a young man, but uh, when I was a young boy, I should say. I was 10. And... Um, I remember he and his friends talking around the house, and it was a, a lot of it was about religion. They were religious men, but they were very religious. I, my father once pulled over, and remember, this is back in the 60s, he saw a guy selling Xmas trees. <laughs> <laughs> so he pulled over the car, we lived in the Bronx on White Plains Road, and he got out and just berated this guy. He said, it's not Christmas, it's not Xmas, it's Christmas. <laughs> Right, right, and he's, yeah. you know, very religious, but never stepped foot in a church. I, I, I don't ever remember him going to church. He or his friends. Very odd. So, um, their discussions always bordered on hidden type of knowledge, almost like Gnostic knowledge. But, you know, nine years old, I wasn't grasping at all, but I knew what they were saying in these, like, hurried little conversations was pretty important so I tried to pay attention um, but he died when I was young I was 10 years old and what kind of sealed it there for me was he passed away in the morning one day when we were supposed to go to school it was a work, uh, a work day and he just died suddenly mm-hmm. so I was lying in bed with my brother we all slept in the same room and a voice came to me and he said Joe you're going to hear that I died don't worry, I'm okay. And it was my father's voice. Wow. And sure enough, a minute later, my older brother, who was seven years older, came into the room. He says, guys, I have to tell you something. And I said, are you going to say dad died? <laughs> and my brother looked at me and said, how do you know? And he goes, I, I think he just told me. So a few weeks after that, that his presence in the house, I could always still feel it, you know? Mm-hmm. So I had another dream. There was, this was an actual dream. I was actually sleeping. And in this dream, we lived in a Bronx on a hill. And I was playing catch with my little brother. <clears throat> this was the part that sealed off me where I knew that there has to be something other than this world. That this world was just a pretext to something beyond us. And I'm sitting, standing on the hill, and I'm throwing down the hill because I didn't want to chase the ball. So I made my little brother go down the hill. <laughs> and in the dream... I see a butterfly, a big, beautiful butterfly, come by. He flies off to my right, onto my neighbor's lawn. And I look over, and there's a rabbit on the lawn. And then I hear my father's voice say, 
Joe, look out, get off the road. I turn around and a car <laughs> came over the hill and landed right where I was, had jumped away from. So about two weeks later, I'm playing catch with my little brother. Same exact scenario. Butterfly goes by, little rabbit on the lawn. <laughs> And I said to myself, this is just like, uh uh-oh. And I jumped out of the way, and I yelled to my brother, Bobby, get off the street. And sure enough, a car came over the crest of the hill, landed right where I would have been standing, and took off down the hill. And my brother and I were, you know, out of safely out of the way at that point. Those instances told me there's something other than, obviously, there's a spiritual world. Got to be a way to stay halfway connected to this world (laughs) so that we can... uh, you know, not lose our loved ones, so to speak. And um, when these things all happen, I, I, I lived in that nether world, you know, kind of one foot in and one foot out my whole life. But then uh, I just looked at policies of the, of the government and the way the world was playing out. And I realized it just doesn't work this way. It can't be. It makes no sense. Why are we talking about this? I had an argument just the other day, not an argument, a discussion with someone the other day about uh, global warming. Mm-hmm. Convinced that there's global warming. And I said, if there's global warming, it's done by the sun. Well, we went back and forth about the sun and blah, blah, blah. Why don't you believe the scientists? I said, let me ask you a question. If the scientists are interested <laughs> in global warming and not selling carbon credits, which is really what this is all about, is selling carbon credits, so there's another product for Wall Street to get rich on. I said, why don't they do something about it? Why don't we have solar energy? Germany, half of their outload that they, half of the output of their of their country is done by solar energy. How come they can do it and we can't? So that ended the argument. <laughs> So all these little discrepancies, and then when 911 happened, that was the end of it. I said, that's it. Something just doesn't fit here. They're trying to tell us the buildings fell down, two airplanes knocked down three buildings, uh, fires, and, the, <laughs> and they came straight down into their own footprint. It just made no sense to me. So at that point, I became convinced that there's just another government. <laughs> and I looked into... Operation Paperclip, uh, which is kind of what the how this book starts out, and I realized, you know, there's merit to this, and, but being a person with one foot in and one foot out of reality, <laughs> I just noticed that uh, there's an occult side to this Operation Paperclip, and we found out that um, in some research and uh, reading books by Jim Mars, Jim Mars, great researcher. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. I came up with um, the fact that Germany in the 30s was very advanced. They had TV. I mean, I was, I'm 58. I didn't have TV when I was 10. <laughs> and I'm 58 years old. I was born in 1954. So, but Germany, they had TV in the 30s. They had all this technology. And when they asked the scientists in charge, how did you, and these were the scientists we brought over to run NASA, basically. Right, right, but yeah. How did you come across all of this knowledge? How did you get so advanced so quickly? Their answer was, we had alien technology. We were able to communicate with aliens. So from that point forward, I kind of dedicated a few years of my life to researching that occult side of it and got fascinated by it. Let me, go, let me back you up a little bit. Mm-hmm. 9-11... You live in New York. Now, you don't live in uh, New York City proper, but you live close proximity to that. Right. I'm in Rockland County, which is about 30 minutes north. I was born and raised in New York. But But something felt wrong about 9-11 from the minute it happened. The actual minute it happened. It, it, it was like instantaneous. Mm-hmm. Um, people who have watched events... Um, know how news breaks oddly enough with 9-11 we had wall-to-wall coverage almost from the very instant exactly and my sense of this early on was before i got to the point which was you know the realization that oh my god that you know alex jones said it you know inside job what took me a while to get to there Mm -hmm. 
but the sense that something was wrong, something was something was mysteriously wrong with this event. Something right. was there was a spiritual weirdness to this. Yes. The day before this event happened, I had something occur to me that was what I would I would call a psychic break. Basically, I felt in, just grieved. Um, I went off by myself for about an hour and literally at one point wept. I had no idea emotionally what was going on inside of me mm-hmm. until that morning. And it wasn't a vision. It was just a sense. It was foreboding. It was a sense of right. something horrible. Mm-hmm. And so, you know, in, in, in a way, and I ask people this when I talk about 9-11, I don't talk about it a lot. What their sense is, people who are sensitive can feel spirit. They can feel the ethereal around them, and they know. Right. If you felt that. I felt it that morning. It was, I don't know if you remember that morning. It's oh, here in the Northeast. It was beautiful. Beautiful day. I mean, to this day, it was remarkable in its beauty. It was just an outstanding day. And I was going out to work. I had at that point, uh, I I owned a delicatessen, and I opened early, like 4 o'clock in the morning. And I just remember, while I was driving in and opening the store, like, my God, this is a gorgeous day. This is going to be a beautiful day. But something, it was almost too beautiful, you know? Um, It was almost too perfect. It's almost like it was staged. <laughs> and, you yeah. Know? yeah, exactly. And yeah. I just said to myself, it's just one of those days that it's either going to be a great day or it's going to be a rocious day. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And, and then this happened, and I watched the buildings fall straight down. I had two thoughts. Number one was, that's a controlled demolition. <laughs> and <clears throat> number two was, uh, how many people are going to be affected by this? The people who passed away, yes. But it was, that's, we've never recovered. Our economy has never recovered from that day. So I just stood at it and watched it. And then the second building came down. I was like, my God, these buildings fell straight down. That's got to be impossible. I, I, besides owning a deli at that point, I, I'm also been a plumbing contractor my whole adult life. In and out of commercial and residential buildings continually. I own my own company, you know. And, um, yeah, did a lot of design work. And I just looked at it and said, it's got to be impossible for two buildings, I don't care how identical they are, to fall exactly the same way. Then when I went home, and that whole, the rest of that day was a fog. And I made it home, and then we saw the uh, building seven collapse again straight on down and I, I, that was it I said it's got to be possible the odds of this are got to be like every grain of sand on every beach in the world is to one <laughs> this was <laughs> a know? building that wasn't even hit directly right. Right. It, and apparently had very little collateral damage right right and if you've seen the um, YouTube clips if you go and look at them you'll see the collapse You'll see the penthouse collapse first, and then it starts to all, it, it's, it, it's an interior demolition, it has to be. Which also, which begs the question, it, you can't, they, you can't wire a building the size of building seven in a few hours. That, it, that's six months or years worth of work. So, someone knew something was up. I want to go back for a minute, though, and get your take on this. There was a sequence that went with 9-11. And for me, it began with Waco, Texas, and mm-hmm. Kansas City, the federal building in Kansas right. City. Right. And those events felt so wrong. It was so mm-hmm. overt. Now, <laughs> you know, we're going back to Waco, which is the Clinton administration and Janet Reno, and what occurred there. Right. And the real story came out mm-hmm. pretty quick. Right. Then Kansas City happened, mm-hmm. and again, the information kind of bubbled up. Now, right. we're in the earliest days of the Internet. This is not yet a major platform. Even in 2001, we did not have YouTube. We did not have social networking. We didn't have blogs. The mm-hmm. people had not yet at that point 
begun to access the power of this mass communication media. Right. There was consciousness there. Right. There was a sense mm -hmm. that people had of no longer really being fully trusting of their government. Right. And by 9-11, I think we hit, you know, and it's a cliche term, but I'll use it anyway, the tipping point where enough people went, wow, there are mm -hmm. so many things wrong with this picture. And right. it became the mother load of right. conspiracy theories. What, it, what I think it did for people my age, in our 50s, our late 50s, we may be the last generation that actually got an education in critical thinking. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah. When that happened, our critical thinking, to, to, for me it did, because all of those events we just talked about, now that you bring it up, and I think about all those events have one thing in common. Waco, uh, Murrah Building, 911, all the evidence I said of all those City. three disasters Columbus City. Right, <laughs> were immediately yeah. dis dis discharged, were immediately buried away. If a, if a Cessna airplane goes down and two people break an ankle, they take that plane and they reassemble it and they do everything they can to find out a reason why that plane went down. But 911, Waco, Texas, the Murray building, immediately they discarded all of everything the Everything's bulldozed. They took the Waco, they took the uh, Murray building, the Oklahoma, Oklahoma City bombing building, right. and buried it and capped it with 25 feet of concrete and put a 24-hour guard on it yeah. to this day. <laughs> Any other crime scene in the world gets investigated. The guy stabs his wife in an argument. They cordon off the building and do all kinds of research. Here, thousands of people are passing or dying, uh, and you bury a building to just do away with the, with the evidence. So those, when that happens, you know something's up. Because that, that says, we don't want to know what happened. <laughs> And we don't want anyone else to even... And we don't want anybody else to know. You know. And I do stand correct. I see somebody in the chat room pointed out. I said Kansas City, it's Oklahoma, the Murrah building. Mm -hmm. But I, as we were talking, I was kind of... Because now in my mind, that's like a chain of events that have occurred. Right. And um, going to 9-11, it appears as though... What you said was very important with critical thinking. Mm -hmm. Um we did learn that we right. we got that because we came out of the generations before us that still exercise it as a practical matter right i also think that if you look now at and i'm not putting down the, the newest generations because my children are part of them exactly but we're in a change in terms of human consciousness that's kind of tran transitional mm -hmm. i would say we're post literate but at the same time, I would also say that a lot of the kids today just get it. They don't need a lot of the proof and the facts. They already do not trust the system. Right. Well, there's a part of this that goes back, and I touch on it briefly in the book. It's kind of um, reminiscent of Carl Jung's theory that there's a mass consciousness. Mm -hmm. um, in uh, Princeton University... There's a device, and um, it, what it's used, it's used to monitor the Internet. And what it does, it's a generator, and they collect data on, the, on this generator. On certain days, like the morning of 911, this was there was a, a yeah, tremendous spike. Random number generator, yeah. Random number generator. There was a tremendous spike on the morning that Princess Diana was killed. Yes. That day that Princess Diana, also a tremendous spike before the event. Now, scientists in England did a study a few years ago that said they wanted to see about predictions. And what they said was, we can, we, our mind actually knows the choice seconds before we enact the choice, mm -hmm. physically. Mm -hmm. We consciously know what choice. Picking a color, anything like that. Our mind picks up and knows what it's going to do instinctively almost before we actually do it and before we actually make a conscious decision to do it. It's an unconscious thing. So if this truly exists, then events like what happened to you on 911, why you felt that way the day before, um, 
how I felt the morning of 911. We didn't feel that alone. Millions of people had these kinds of feelings. And it showed up on this remote generator in Princeton University. There's only been a few instances where they've noticed this spike, and they've always been uh, worldwide events, you know, almost yeah, yeah. catastrophic type events. Yeah. Uh, but we're talking about here is basically the unified field, the mm -hmm. unified consciousness. Right. Which, of course, you know, you go back and you look at the, uh, the early remote viewing research that was done at, at, at Standard Research, and they were using RNGs there. They were right. using them prob probabilistically at that point. But one of the interesting stories that came out of SRI was how Ingo Swan was able to walk into a laboratory and mm -hmm. begin to actually game the random number generator computer that they had. Right. So there, it's a two-way thing. We right. are per receivers and we are also transmitters right. in consciousness. And that, because that, we're all in that consciousness, in yeah. that stream of consciousness. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So the heightening waves of this thing we've been feeling for a long time, you know, I, I, time itself, you know. Do well, we, time, time is... All the, we're in the future and the present and the past all the, in the same second yeah. but there's really no time <laughs> right, right. so if you were to take that into another like passing away spirit um, I don't think a spirit would have any boundaries about time um, no they can react instantaneously to something that we haven't even imagined yet you know I would think, because they're in, a, they're in, an, in a dimension where time doesn't really exist. We made up time. Time exactly, was made up. Exactly. We did make up time. It's our invention. Right. Time is an invention. They say by, in the Gnostic teachings and in the mystery school teachings, they say that it was invented by the god of Saturn, the gods who live on Saturn, who um, are the, in the Greek and Roman gods is, um, oh, jeez. I, uh, okay, it'll come to me in a second. But a major god in, in our mythologies. And this god invented time. Kronos. Uh, called Kronos. Is the, that's why chronology came mm -hmm, from. Mm -hmm. but which, his is name attached, in, it's, which is attached to Saturn. Right, it's attached enough. to Saturn. Yeah. Yeah. Saturn has a very mysterious um, test. In the Gnostic religions, the Gnostic Christian religions, they teach that the Antichrist will come from a moon of Saturn mm -hmm. called Iapetus. Mm -hmm. And the funny thing is, in the movie uh, 2001, Space Journey, Space Odyssey, exactly. Stanley Kubrick's original Called uh, for adaptation was, the, they, they weren't going to Jupiter. No, they, they were, were going to, to Iapetus. Yeah, oh, right. And that was changed. Uh, uh, Arthur C. Clarke urged him to change that in the movie, and Arthur C. Clarke, we know, is a high-ranking Mason. And... Um, he, they lived together in London, and um, he urged them to change that. He said, "I'll just change that from my app, but make it Jupiter." <laughs> George and, um, George Kavasilis was here last week, and he talked a little bit about Saturn and okay. his impressions of Saturn, having uh, you know had numerous contacts with off-world beings and what Saturn really represented, the energies of Saturn. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's interesting this comes up again this week. We're talking right. about it. Saturn yeah. and Kronos and these influences that come from these planetary forces and apparently even off-worlders. Right. Well, so, that would, yeah, that begs the question. That's the whole teachings of these mystery schools that go back to the Sumerian times. Right up through the Egyptians into the Romans and into the modern world. Yeah, uh, went into the, the, the I guess, yeah. even the post-Greek Christian culture, um, mm -hmm. uh, right up to the, the time of the Cathars. Um, right. While you've brought this subject up, it's interesting because I had I noted in your book that you deal with the Archons, and this is a... This is a pretty deep subject. What right. are the archons, and and what are they, what are they influencing? What is the effect that the archons have had on humanity? Well, the theory is going back, and these are from the Gnostic teachings. These are from the uh, gospels that were hidden 
then they're not in the Bible. But according to these uh, ancient teachings, because they kind of preceded Christianity, uh, the Manichaeans, they also believed in this. And there was, the Manichaeism was the first mm -hmm. worldwide religion. Mm -hmm. um, many religions are based on it. A lot of the, even Cathar beliefs were kind of based on it. But anyway, in their teachings, these beings exist. They are, they are other dimensional beings. They cannot physically interact with us, but they can interact with our situation. They can make, uh, make us feel jealousy, rage, envy, hate, love. And they feed off of these energies like a psychic vampire. Now, in the mystery school teachings, a lot of the mystery school teachings, and even in the Masons, they go through rituals where it's a fake death. Um, the Masons, you were pushed backwards of someone grabs you and they, after having been artificially hit over the head with a bat. And all these religions have a similar ceremony. And it is to prepare us for the life after death. Because that's when the true mm, struggle begins. In the mystery school teachings, when we leave our body, we're not pure enough to go to be with God. We have to be purged, let's say, mm -hmm. of um, our emotions, our negative emotions. And what they teach is that you can look at beings like the archons two ways. They're either angels or devils. They're either doing you a favor so you can continue on to be with God, or you're going through this terrible process where they literally rip these sins from your body. Um, and it's interesting is that there's a mechanism in mythology called a soul catcher. Right, right. And this soul catcher is located on the dark side of the moon, according to mythologies. The gods... The Roman and Greek gods were all the same, just different names. Retreated to the dark side of the moon when mankind developed timelines, chronology. We became so entrenched in the everyday now that we lost our spiritual side. Uh, with that, we lost ways to communicate with the gods, and they they escaped to the moon. Not escaped, but left. They didn't want to even. They didn't want to be with us. <laughs> And on the moon is this soul catcher. And, I, and I, I've heard references to it, and I actually was listening to a tape of John Lear talking about it one. John Lear's father, as you may know, he invented the Lear jet. And John Lear was a pilot for the CIA. And he decided to come forward with knowledge about extraterrestrials and, you know, secret government. And he brought up the subject of the soul catcher. So when I heard that, it was good. I realized that uh, you know there's more to it coming from different sides. Whenever I was when I was researching this book, and I wanted to find something out, almost like it's synchronicity just kicked in. You know, whenever I wanted to think of, uh, find something, I would click to the next page on the computer, and it would be there. <laughs> so it was almost like it was being handed to me. So I decided to make it into a fiction because, uh, as Oscar Wilde said, you know, if you're going to tell people the truth. You're going to make them laugh or they'll kill you. <laughs> so I decided to uh, make it a fiction, an entertaining type book that people will be able to get into, and also throw in some little hidden knowledge to bed and try to make it like uh, as mundane as possible, just so people might be interested and then go on the computer and look it up for themselves, you know, or grab a book or go to the library, you know? Yeah. Well, there's a lot of research out there, and there's a lot of people who have done deep work. What you did with this book was you put it in a form that was entertaining, and yet at the same time, it brought a lot of information from different time streams, different historical landmarks, into a, a narrative. And there's embeds in this book. 
Um, I've been surprised scanning back through it. You sent this book to me last year, and I read it then, and I've kind of scanned back over it again. And I'm, I was surprised at how much I found going through it the second time that I didn't see the first time. Right. And for some people to read a lot of factual, detailed research is very painful, and whereas putting it in a fictional backdrop not only makes it entertaining, but it brings it into um, a reality stream where it's like watching a movie or TV. The mind relaxes enough to begin to absorb the information. Right. Right. You see, we, there's a wall that people have in their minds. We've re recently, psychologists have come up with the term cognitive dissonance. And what it means is you can show somebody evidence. You can say this is why this happened. And if the point you're trying to make is something that's going to require them to rethink everything they know, <laughs> then they're not going to think it. it. It's better for them to protect their mind than to delve into how to... How could it be? That can't be. That's not what I thought, you know? I had a friend say to me once, well, you talk about these conspiracies. Mm -hmm. how, could they, how could these conspiracies possibly take place? I said, you know how the best place to hide a conspiracy? Behind an ego. Because most people think they're the smartest people in the world. No one wants to admit, and this was my biggest point, you know, when I hit this wall uh, in 2001, where I just had to know how to rethink everything. I had to admit, I had to strip all the pride from myself, from my ego. I had to admit that I'm some stupid. Someone actually was smarter than me, and made me think that this is how the world works, and it just doesn't, we can't be that it works that way. And getting to that point uh, is sometimes impossible. Um, I used to be in the Rotary Club. I used to be the president of the Rotary Club. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was part of that with, too for about five minutes, yeah. <laughs> Actually, I was for years. I mean, and I sat in a room with 50 guys who thought they were the 50 smartest people in the world. Men and women, that's just guys. I was in the Rotary Club when only men were allowed, but then women came in. You cannot tell people like that. You know what? The economy doesn't work the way you think it works. That money in your wallet isn't money. It's an IOU. It says it right there. Note. The legal term of a note is an IOU. It's not saying it's money. You're well, saying it's money. The so-called <laughs> smartest people, the people who are part of, well, in a Rotary Club, you're going to see professionals, lawyers, doctors. Right. I think you're only allowed to have one of each profession right. or specialty right. in there. Right. But they're the most educated. But they're educated in what? The way the system works. Exactly. I work with professionals all the time. They're mm -hmm. rigid. They're entrenched in the system. Right. They really are not very creative in their thinking, and if you right. pull them out of the box for a second, mm -hmm. you get the deer in the headlight look. Yep, yeah, they're lost. Yeah. Yep. Upton Sinclair, the, the writer, said it, the perfect line he had. It's impossible to get a man to understand something when his livelihood depends on his not understanding it. Exactly. So if you are so entrenched in the system, you work in on Wall Street, and someone like me comes along and says, but you, there is no money. You don't own any. You can't own it. That stuff in your wallet is an IOU. They, they, no, what are you kidding me? I bought a house with this. I said, no, you didn't. You're not. Look on the lease. It says you're the lease. <laughs> on the deed, it says you're the leaser, not the owner of the house. I bought and sold two houses in my life. Paid them off. I was never listed as the owner on the and then any of those deeds. Because <laughs> you don't know. You can't own something you can't buy something with a debt if no, i owe you a thousand that's why they bucks, call it a mortgage it's a it's a right. me dead measurement so you're dead yeah if i owe you a thousand bucks you can't go and buy a cuisinart at macy's and say look i don't have any money but joe Tomo owes me a thousand bucks so we're going to transfer that debt to him macy's going to tell you go take a powder you, know, you can't do that you can't transfer one debt with another but that's how our economy works. But you keep <laughs> but trying to get someone who works in the economy to agree with that, even though they know that that's how it works. You take a dollar <laughs> bill, and I've done this with people. You take the dollar bill and you show it to them and you say, what does this say? Mm -hmm. And it tells you basically that this instrument 
is and I forget the verbiage on the dollar bill that's terrible I don't have one I don't have my wallet it's, it's a note Federal Reserve note it's a debt note you know mm-hmm. All debts, public and private, is the term right. that you have right. to focus on there. And, and, and they look at you and they go, all debts, public and private. What is that? Right. I said, go home and pull out your mortgage. Mm-hmm. If you lease, pull lease out. And understand that what you're dealing with here isn't equity. There right. is no value in this. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, you have to think about that. The, the, the subtle um, genius in that. Because if you need to control people, like people are always talking about we're going to have martial law, we're going to have martial law. They don't need martial law. They have money. No, no, I'm not of the opinion that martial law is necessary at all. We're in cages, right. walking We're already around. in martial law. Yeah, we just don't exactly. call it. Yeah. <laughs> you know, it kind of exists in it again, you know. All you need is money. You can't exist in this country without money. You can't barter. They made that illegal a few years ago. So they it, made that illegal twenty year, over twenty years ago. 20 I watched years my ago. parents be prosecuted by IRS over a trade exchange. <laughs> yeah, right. Because you have to have money. So without it, you're gonna. You know, the the big scare in us is, oh God, I won't have health insurance. Oh God, I won't have uh, retirement. I won't have this. I won't have that. Well, hell, yeah. Obama will give you a cell phone now. <laughs> What's that? Obama will give you a, a cell phone now. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, because it's another way to be indebted to the state. <laughs> and if you look at it, um, even if you look at libertarians, which I consider myself one, but if you look at Ron Paul, great guy, he says phenomenal things. I wish he would have won the election. Not that I think the president would have that much power if, he did, if uh, the powers that be don't want it to be. It's not going to be. You can look at Kennedy for that. Right, right, yeah. Kennedy tried to do away with money. He came up with... Uh, silver reserves. Silver certificate money. Yeah. shot in the head three months later. Yep. You know? Uh, Abraham Lincoln came up with greenbacks to pay for the Civil War. Boom, he got shot in the head. You know, it's it's a clear and, and, and uh, a clearly set message. Don't mess with us or we're going to shoot you in the head. <laughs> you know, um, it's just a way to be indebted. And once you're indebted, you don't need chains. Because if you have to earn money to buy food, because no one knows how to grow their own food anymore, and now with GMO and Monsanto's GMO food coming up, you won't be able to anyway. So you can't farm. You can't trade and barter. Well, if you remember back in the 80s what happened, and they've been doing this for decades, the uh, the great debacle over, over all the farms that were taken over. I mean, those mm-hmm. farms wound up being repossessed by banks who then turned around and sold them to Monsanto right. and ConAgra and all mm-hmm. of the agribusinesses to turn over the soil into propagating the GMO crops that were right. part of this whole deal. Right. And unfortunately, and Willie Nelson can't do enough concerts to turn that thing around. Right, right. And that was the whole lead up to this supposed movement of the Patriot Movement. That was all started by farmers. Yes, yes. For this very reason. They were losing their farms. They got together to find out a way to break the banks. Um, when they started organizing into situations where they were powerful enough to maybe even come up with their own resources to break the bank, Waco, Texas was used as an example. Don't mess with us. We'll come over there and kill you and your kids. And they used it as an excuse that it was a, some kind of religious patriot music. Uh, uh, movement that was going to overthrow the government and you know and the, that's the message that was sent that's why it happened that and we needed a blood sacrifice because it was a satanic holiday always a blood sacrifice right it's a satanic holiday yeah, uh, yeah. It's, it was birthday it's it's a uh, it's written down in the satanic calendar as a time to sacrifice children the Murrah building Waco all happened around that time, April 20th. Uh, there were all children involved. So it's, yeah, it, it, that's the other part of it is you have to think back and say, can a human be that devious? And that's what leads me down the path of, yes, we can be, 
but somebody's got to be teaching us how to be this. <laughs> it's not in our nature to be this. Part of you know? what, yeah, Joe. Part of what I've done in studying, and it's mostly been in recent years with these um, mass shooting events, uh, tracking little details behind them. Going back to the Virginia Tech shooting, uh, the shooting of Gabriel Gitz Gifford in, mm -hmm. in New Mexico. Right. These are just the big ones. There's a bunch in between. The uh, Aurora, Colorado shooting going up to Sandy Hook. And when you begin to look at the details, if you look at lunar cycles, dates, times, numeric sequences, signatures of the killers themselves, names that come in to the right. narrative... You begin to notice creepy aspects of this, and mm -hmm. quite honestly, when I was doing the Aurora, Colorado shooter, the the, the Batman massacre, it was actually making me nauseous to deal right. with the details of what went into that, because when you get to the point where we got last December with Sandy Hook, mm -hmm. and you realize there's numerically no way all of this stuff is right. a coincidence right something else is going on are we back to the archons now yes because what happens when you research this when I research these things and I realize that perhaps there is a spiritual be it a dark one connection in here involved one thing happens the fear goes away because you start to realize wait a minute there is an ex that could be an explanation for this there's, there's an explanation there's a way to resist it and if that's the case then these arconic entities have to crush you those are the most dangerous times in a person's life spiritually and physically because those are the times when the attacks are going to occur you're going to get sick you're going to better watch where you go because you might up a hole and break your ankle. If something's going to happen to snap you back to their reality, which is supposedly our reality. Because you need to suffer. Because if you're not suffering, they aren't getting any energy from it. And if you can be aware, that's all you really need, and that's what these mystery schools teach, is not to be afraid of it, to be aware of it. Because if you're faced with yeah. this thing, even after death, when you're faced with maybe what would be the most horrible of your life, you're going to laugh at it and say, I knew you were coming. <laughs> Somebody you know, in the standard. chat room just brought this up. This is a great question. Mm -hmm. They said, if you think about it, could all the things we are seeing being orchestrated be for the purpose of waking people up? Now, <laughs> that may not be their design, but when we go into, I guess what you would call causative good and evil, and probably the way the universe is attuned, there's a duality in everything, but it all serves one purpose. And you just nailed the essential element, the awareness. Right. When you become aware, even though you look at an event like Aurora, Colorado, Sandy Hook, the Kennedy assassination, it really doesn't matter. You right. suddenly realize that there is evil, and the stark contrast of evil against good becomes the pivotal awareness that brings to it brings you to a place where you now move up another level. Right. You hit it with 9-11. I mean, I've been going through this for most of my life, and so have you. So have most of the people that are on the chat room or listening to this show. Right. They were vaguely aware of it, and then they got a little more aware of it, and something in their life would kick it, and it would go up another level. Right. Well, on a collective basis right now, tell me what you think. Is humanity getting an escalated collective awareness that's now kind of coming home to roost? Yes. And one of the reasons I think might be um, that we, we are experiencing, we've moved through another age. You know, there are ages of 26,000 years, right? Solar ages. Uh, Typical ages. That's when an age is. It's 26,000 years. Right. Uh, there was the age of Aquarius there was, and so on. You know what I mean? Yes. Um, we're, we've gone to another age. And in this age, for the next 26,000 years, we're lined up with the center of the Milky Way and the center of the universe. It's all in one line. Um, this direct line happens, you know, rarely. 
There's, there's 12 ages, one very constellation, and 26,000 years between them. Um, at this point, the light, the energy of the universe is on us. We can't help but be uh, aware of it. We have a um, part of our brain called the pineal gland. Um, if you see in ancient sculptures, it's shaped like a, there's always a symbol of an acorn. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Because that's what the pineal gland looks like, an acorn. The pineal gland um, secretes a chemical called DMZ. It's, it's, um, it's a it's hallucinogenic. A hallucinogenic. Okay, now, this answers a question that was asked on the chat earlier, too, so mm-hmm. go for it. Okay. <laughs> now, okay, see synchronicity again. So, our pineal glands hold this tiny little chemical. It is the chemical that releases upon our death. And scientists say that's our near-death experiences or when the pineal gland uh, secretes this chemical. Um, the ancients knew about it. The evil side of nature knew about it to the point where they would have human sacrifices and carve your pineal gland out of your brain while you were still alive to get the chemical from it. Um, these were the Dionysius type cults of the past. Right, right. Um, it's important that we have that gland. It's important that we can communicate spiritually. But there's one thing that will mess up your pineal gland. <laughs> And that's fluoride. Right. What have we been putting in our water since the Nazis told us about fluoridation? It's fluoride. If you look at a pineal gland that has fluoridation contamination, it can cal- the calcium builds up over it. It in- encapsulates the pineal gland, therefore effectively blocking it off. Now, there's an a ancient myth that the moon wasn't part of the Earth. The moon was brought here. These are ancient cultures, and ancient cultures around the world. The Hopi Indians, the Aborigines, the ancient Greeks that preceded Plato and Aristotle talked about the moon being brought to the earth. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> their, um, their belief in this moon being brought to the earth was to block that energy that we, so we couldn't receive it. It would block that source of energy from the universe that we were directly getting without the moon being in the way. Because the moon is in the exact place it has to be for a solar eclipse, for a lunar eclipse. If the moon was back or forth just a little bit out of where the orbit is right now, there would never be a total solar eclipse. You couldn't have it. Right, right, yeah. Um, That event... Uh, and among other events, David Icke talks about this. It was one of the, it was one of the most fascinating <laughs> parts of his books is how the moon is the exact size it has to be. It's in the exact position that it has to be in. It's one of the few planetary objects that doesn't rotate. We always see the same side of the moon. Scientists say it does actually rotate, but it rotates at such a speed that we don't notice it. I just had a conversation last night with some friends of mine up in Canada who are um, Jewish people. They're not traditional Jewish people they're not traditional Christians but they are um, believing Hebrews who have been working for years on a project called self-defining Hebrew and I was talking to this I was talking to my friend last night and I asked him a question at some point in the narrative I said where in the creation in Genesis is the moon and he said it's not there and that was you know I just wanted his opinion I've read it but I wanted the opinion of somebody I knew also had some scholarship behind them. It's not there. Right. So the, even, um, even from a biblical standpoint, that moon was not part of the original creation. Exactly. And like in these aboriginal uh, societies, anything earlier than 14,000 years ago have oral, because there's no written um, histories from them, of the moon not being there, the moon being brought to the earth um, and placed there. It's it's an art. It's a, it's an artificial construct. Um, we know that NASA even says the moon is hollow because when they dropped the lunar module upon takeoff, when they were returning to Earth, when the when the astronauts returned to Earth, 
and they jettisoned the lunar module and he landed on the moon the moon echoed for three hours and they could pick it up on the instruments that they left on the moon as if it were hollow almost all the craters on the moon are almost exactly the same depth <laughs> it's almost like it was just put there you know painted on hey let's put this here and you know it's almost it's almost like it was an artificial construct this construct brought here as a maybe it's a, a, a spaceship you know people have been talking about since when the invention of the telescope people have been talking about seeing ufos on the moon mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. um you know it's back to the time of jules verne it's what inspired jules verne to write uh half of his thing you know it's very interesting that all these ancient um technologies that go past the point of 10,000 years ago. That seems to be the key point, is all of a sudden we had civilization. You know, we went from like Cro-Magnon man <laughs> to living in cities and having abacuses and being able to build ships and trade back and forth. No one can explain it, how this happened so quickly. Um, so it's, it's an interesting point. But um, back to the pineal gland, I think that that's how we'll wake up. Whoever can manage to decalcify the pineal gland or hasn't been contaminated with fluoride. I you gotta, you gotta laugh at that. That here's the chemical that we used, we've known since the 1800s that fluoride was uh, carcinogen. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And we've, we've, they made, arrangements for it in Teddy Roosevelt's organization, uh, presidency to well, not was, have it contaminate our water. It was also and now we're a, get into water. It was also a byproduct of aluminum manufacturing, oh, right. or as our British friends say, aluminium. <laughs> well, what ramped up kind of during World War II, that after it, you had this explosion of well, aluminum, cookware, everything was made right. out of aluminum in the 50s. <laughs> because that's the time when we brought... Uh, Operation Paperclip for Nazis to the United States. And we started using their scientists instead of our own. And that occult uh, pseudoscience has been running this country ever since. Why do we have to pay so much for oil when in Germany they're running 53% of their countries running on solar energy? Well, why because are we running on oil at all when 100 years ago uh, we had Tesla out there who basically right. gave us the ability and it was suppressed and every right. major technology that's been what you would call free or zero point energy has been suppressed. Right, right. You know what it is, it's... Um, this one's going to go back. Sorry. Um, yeah, you have that. You know why? Because you can't fight a war over solar energy. Everybody gets it for free. You know, it's the, the other part that crashed out. I had cancer a few years ago, and it was bad. It was stage four, and the doctor told me if there was a stage five, you had stage five. <laughs> so I refused the chemotherapy. So, um, hello? Okay, you got me? Yeah, you're still I'm good. sorry. That's okay. I lost you for a second. I understand. So I refused the chemotherapy and I, I said, no, you know what? I'm not going to put poison into my body. Let me, I'll just fight it on my own. Take out the kidney that was cancerous and we'll take it from that. Well, it was more than that, the kidney, but it was whatever they did, they did. The next day, uh, the next week when I finally got out of the hospital, I was like, you know, I got to get in the sun. And this was years ago before I knew about vitamin D. And I just felt this need to be in the sun. Now I find out that vitamin D is the best carcinogen on the uh, anti carcinogen on the planet, and you get it from the sun. <laughs> yeah, yep, exactly. But what are they trying to do today? Mm -hmm. Today they tell you the sun is bad for you. You got to put sunblock on. You've got to buy vitamin. You got to have vitamin D. So why don't you buy it from us? We'll manufacture it for you. And instead of going standing in the sun and getting it for free, the way God intends it to be so. You know, it, it, everything is just such a facade. How people don't see through it is just amazing. Well, and then we have the um, aerosol projects, solar uh, mm. uh, chemtrails, which I believe partially there's it's a multi-headed hydra there, but part of it is solar dimming. I mean, you look at what happens when they fly over, and the um, the, the sun rays coming into the Earth drop by about forty to forty-five percent. Mm -hmm. 
Well, when you think about what we're talking about with blocking the uh, blocking the energy from the universe, maybe since there's no way to reposition the moon <laughs> without telling everybody it's there, because uh, you got to remember when we everybody thinks that we just fly around each other in a circle. But at the same time that we're flying around, all the planets are flying around the sun in a circle, we're also moving in a straight line. Mm -hmm. And once we got along in that straight line to the point where the light in the universe can hit us, there is no blocking it. The moon, nothing is going to be in our way. So now that that's happened, maybe they need to shield us from this. And they need to come up with a chemical uh, concoction that will help to block out energy from the universe you know yeah there's something yeah. going on there yeah we have to let it read that we need to know for 100 years <laughs> we're going to take that Joe we're going to take that you're kind of breaking up a little bit on your phone, too. I don't know if you're on a portable or... I'm getting a peek. You know what? I'm going to hang this phone up and pick up my other phone. This phone might be going down. That's good. Well, you know what we're going to do? We're going to take a break at this point. Okay, great. I'm going to hang you're up gonna and then I'll pick no, up. No, okay, don't hang up. Uh, pick oh. up. Keep one phone in one hand because I don't want to reconnect you. Well, I'm trying to do that, but I don't think... <laughs> okay, I got it. Can you hear me now? You're good. You're good. No, it's just easier to not hang up. Yeah, I'm not getting you on the other phone. Okay. You try to Okay. What we're going to do is we're going to take a break here, and we're going to come back. I'll just tell everybody now, uh, Duncan O'Finian and Miranda Kelly will be here in the second hour. Uh, they'll okay. join us online. Joe, get your phone straightened out. We're going to play okay. some music, and we'll be back in about seven or eight minutes. This is Off Planet Radio Live. We will be right back. that all the cultural myths of the ancient indigenous peoples around the world are true. From ancient Greece to the Hopi legends, these stories are all tied together with modern conspiracy theories in the fast-paced fictional novel The Cult of the Black Sun by Joe DeToma. This entertaining book has been called a cross between Dan Brown and Ian Fleming. Read the connections between Nazis and UFOs and the American patriots trying to stop them. Buy it now at Amazon.com or your local bookstore. Second hour of Off Planet Radio Live. I'm Randy Moggins. Everything sounds really, really strange. Not only that, but I've got cues running wild all over the place here. 
it's a, it's a new system. What can I say? Uh, we're basically in a new studio. There's a new setup, and uh, I sound echoey. I don't know if that's coming across to you guys or not, but um, I feel like I'm in an echo tube tonight. So <laughs> it's it's always interesting. We probably have to do some sound baffling in this room as well. Anyway, welcome back. It is the second hour of our Planet Radio Live. It is the last show of February in the ever-revolving universe of uh, the war for your mind. My guest, Joe DeToma, is here with me. We're going to go about uh, to the bottom of the hour with Joe, and then we're going to hopefully connect uh, Duncan and Miranda, and we may take a brief break while we do that, because that's always a difficult situation. And uh, Joe, welcome back. Thank you. Welcome <laughs> Yeah, we were having phone problems as well, so it was just a good time to take a break. Um, yeah. We had some interesting conversations early on um, about Sandy Hook and some mm-hmm. things that you brought in that have to do with that particular region up there. It connects as well to CIA operations, Black Covens, um, Catcher in the Rye, and J.D. Salinger, so uh, let her rip. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, Newtown is about mm, a half hour from here. Um, this whole area is kind of an uh, old, mysterious area. Uh, rock woods, uh, heavy woods, you know, uh, almost so burning. Um, an interesting site is that there's a state park in Newtown called Staten's Kingdom State Park. Now, up until a few weeks ago, if you typed in Satan's Kinder State Park, it came up Newtown, Connecticut. When I put that on my Facebook page and was going to do some research with it, um, another author who I'm friends with on Facebook, all of a sudden it changed to uh, West Hartford, Connecticut. <laughs> same page, you know, same how to get in touch with if you wanted to spend the weekend at Satan's Kingdom State Park. But instead of Newtown, Connecticut, it's now Hartford, Connecticut. Um, wow. They redefined the, the geographic location? Yeah. In other words, that's, you have to write to the office to make an appointment to go there. You're sending your, you're writing to Newtown, Connecticut. There's a church of Satan called the Church of Tiamat, which is located in Newtown. Lovely. Uh, Tiamat is in Gnostic teachings. It's the destroyer of worlds. It's right, supposedly right, right. Yeah. the planet or orb that crashed into the earth that gouged out the moon. Um, that's what scientists would tell us, that the Earth was hit by a planet-sized uh, asteroid, and it dug out the Marianas Trench out of the Atlantic Ocean, and that became the moon. Except when other scientists started doing uh, studies on it, they realized that the moon's bigger than that. <laughs> the moon is actually bigger than it should be. Yeah. So they said that Tiamat turned around, came back, and hit the Earth again. So teams of scientists kept that up, and that wasn't enough. So they said, turn around and came back and hit us three times, which is impossible. You know, it's like three buildings falling down from two airplanes. You know, what are the chances of that? But um, <clears throat> which getting back to the moon, you know, possibly being an artificial uh, sh- ship of sorts. So the ch- uh, Church of Tiamat is located in uh, Newtown. It's supposedly the recruitment center for the Church of Satan which moved from San Francisco to the East Coast. Um, Wonderful. Sure yeah. <laughs> I feel so much better about that. <laughs> now, J.D. Salinger lived uh, not far from Newtown, um, between Greenwich and Westport, which is just south of Newtown. Um, that's where he wrote Catcher in the Rye, which we know is the favorite book of MK Ultra Assassins. <laughs> Um, which is, brings up a funny story because when we talked about this a couple of weeks ago or a week ago we were talking about this the New York Post uh, ran a thing on page 6 which is their you know gossip column about how Mark David Chapman who was caught with a copy of The Catcher in the Rye he was actually reading it when the police came to arrest him for shooting John Lennon he said from his jail cell just last week um, people will not know the significance of Catcher in the Rye 
but it's there. And that's how it was left off. Uh, who knows what else he said, but that's all mentioned in the article. But J.D. Salinger uh, lives there. J.D. Salinger was, at, he went in and out of the different religions. And J.D. Salinger, for a time, was a um, follower of Yokananda. Yokanan Paramananas. Yokananda was the person. I'm glad you got to say that, not me. <laughs> <laughs> he came to um, the United States. He kind of helped introduce yoga um, way back in the 1900, early 1900s, 1910, 1920, and um, helped set up in that area a, um, a yoga center mm -hmm. uh, for studies, yoga studies. It wasn't only just what we say today. People bring their mat and go do exercises. It was a, it was a religion, basically. Um, Adam uh, Lanza and his mother lived on Yokananda Street, which I find fascinating. <laughs> I missed that detail. Yeah, they lived on the street. They lived on it called Yokananda Street. No one knows why that street is named Yokananda Street, except this is that poor Joe. This is part of the sur the surreal. Stuff that riffs through all of this it's like right. to me it's the glue that says there's something that connects all this how does that how could that be you know now Yokananda was not a bad person he wasn't a devil right, worshiper right. or anything yeah. matter of fact he had a lot of run-ins with a spiritual entity he identified as the devil um but it was um Middle Eastern you know philosophy and what sprung up around there was a Theosophical Society. I don't know if you know, the Theosophical Society was kind of like um, uh, well, what Alistair Crowley yeah. based yeah. his uh, religion on. Right. The Theosophical Society, Madame Blavatsky and Alistair Crowley, who was the, head of, who was the reintroduction of the Church of Satan into uh, modern society, was Alistair Crowley. And there was a Theosophical Society right there. <laughs> <laughs> in, that, in that area. Um, it's just it's very interesting how all these things tie together, you know? Um, there's got to be an architect of sorts. Now, is that architect God? No. Why would God do that to us? But God did give us free will mm -hmm. and in a way allowed Satan to be who Satan is, you know? Um, there's no way to stop him without taking away our free will. So, rather than do that, we are free will. You want to go worship Satan and invent money and hold down your fellow man and go to war and do all these atrocities? Well, you know, you have free will to do it, but you're going to pay for it. You're going to answer for it when it's time to face me. You're just going to spend that much more time having your soul cleaned before you're allowed to see me, you know? <laughs> Um, cosmic dry cleaning right <laughs> cosmic dry cleaning <laughs> um, it's, so you get to look at it and say if God's not going to do that and he's certainly not going to who is well who gets off on our suffering the archons who the archons represent perhaps they're the dark angels that represent the legion loyal to Satan and now I went as I'm saying this I gotta just say one thing, and, and I know it sounds crazy, everything I'm saying sounds crazy, but if you research it, it doesn't. But it doesn't sound so crazy anyway. <laughs> but if you do research it, something's gonna happen. You're gonna face some kind of test. Um, there's only one way I have ever found, and it's the way my grandmother taught me. My grandmother was a healer, a um, little old Italian lady, but she was one of those people that other people would come to to have the evil eye removed from them, or if you were suffering from headaches, she would say certain prayers over you. And she taught me these prayers, and these prayers uh, are for St. Michael, the archangel. Mm -hmm. um, it's the only way to protect yourself. You can ask God to protect you, but God kind of doesn't interfere. Your protection has to, he'll protect you. If you really have to rely only on him, I think you'll have protection. But that's why the Archangel Michael is there. See, the Archangel Michael doesn't have any agreement with the devil. <laughs> he doesn't like him, threw him into 
hell at one point and would be glad to do it again. If you have to, and it's in Catholic uh, exorcisms, that's who is invoked, is Michael the Archangel. That's the final invocation in an exorcism to make sure that it just doesn't happen again. And it's basically a very successful uh, plea. Um, so if you find yourself researching this and suddenly your family's treating you differently, <laughs> um, you get migraine headaches you can't get rid of, uh, some kind of something comes up, protect yourself. Mm-hmm. Ask for protection. Um, I know that sounds odd and in today's day and age of uh, new age type of philosophies that uh, sounds archaic but it's the best way ask for help from Jesus ask for help from Michael the Archangel you're going to need it because it's hard to fight them because you see in this day and age we've all taught ourselves that we don't need religion uh, and basically, religion has taught us we don't need religion because look at what's going on today in the Catholic Church. It's a, an abomination. <laughs> so what is, how could that, why? Because... But the, we're not really talking about religion, Joe. We're talking about spirituality. When I'm talking about religion, yes. I'm mm-hmm. talking about people standing together spiritually. That's a religion to me. Um, if you stand alone... And you listen to the New Age teachings of the Theosophical Societies. They tell you, you don't need all this. You can stand alone. You can fight off whatever you have to fight off and make your own reality and all this other stuff, which is true to a point. But there's one point where they, the dark side, group together in that same Jungian mind meld type of uh, power where there's a group of them against little old you because you were told by some half-cocked new ager that you could stand alone uh, and without any help from anybody well that's just not true and it's it's that thinking is designed for our failure it's designed so one person is standing against a legion of 10,000 who are thinking against them but if you can put 10,000 like-minded spiritual people together to band together to protect themselves from 10,000 dark-sided legions. Well, now it's an even fight. And the light's always going to win against the dark. So that's what I just wanted to say is that because I found it, as I research it, I come under the side, I'll sit at the computer researching this and suddenly have a nosebleed. I never get nosebleeds. You know, oh, no, 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 no. I, 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 look, I can tell you right now, there's intense energy going on with this show tonight. And mm-hmm. some, of, some of the listeners are feeling it. I'm getting it. You're probably getting it. Right. Almost every time that we do something like this, there's like energy attacks that occur. Right. And, and, and it, it's, for me tonight, it's been like somebody hooked me up to a negative ground because I feel drained. Right, right. And it's so we have to push forward. And yeah, I... Right. I mean, that's the thing. And my phone went dead. That, my phone never dies. It didn't even send a charger all day. You know? <laughs> You're welcome. Welcome to the off-planet radio effect. Right. So when you're talking about these things, you have to be distracted. They have to distract you. They have to bring you back to their reality, which is a reality of pain and suffering and money and gold and all this other bowl that you have to have to survive, but you don't, you know? But they have to get you back there, and the best way is to hurt you. So if you find yourself researching this, and especially if you find yourself connecting with it, something's going to happen. Uh, and it might not even be physical. It might just be your family treats you different. Um, your friends are standoffish. You know, it's something like that's going to happen. I don't really fit in with any of the crowds I used to hang out with anymore. Because they think I'm a wacko. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, we, we 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 do wind up becoming very isolated and alone. That's one of the common complaints with most people that have gone down this path, and it's part of why you look at the chat rooms tonight. You people are searching to connect with other people, and they mm-hmm. want to do it with like-minded people who have some right. sense for the truth. That's kind of what we do here. We're a catalyst and a springboard for people and people like you who come to the table and bring 
your truth contribute to that and begin to build it up and we can't ignore the spiritual side of it that's right. you know that's it's the all about the spiritual side but that's the hardest part to put together because we're isolated mm -hmm. do you yeah. do you have a, 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 any nuggets of how to work through the isolation well I, I'm a complete believer in synchronicity wherever you are you're supposed to be there. <laughs> yeah. So make the best of it because you're stuck in traffic, you're lost on a road somewhere. You're supposed to be there. There's a lesson to, someone wants to teach you. So um, find out that lesson. If it's a good lesson, that's great. If it's a bad lesson, go refer to page one, invoke some help from... Uh, from Jesus, from from the Archangel Michael, uh, ask for protection. If you ask, you'll get it. If you don't ask, because we have free will, you think you could stand on your own, you're a tough guy, and you're going to stand against a bunch of beings you can't even see, well, then you're going to suffer consequences. Ask for help. If, even if you think it's belittling, belittling yourself. That's what all this New Age philosophy, this humanistic... Uh, religion that sprung up is about. It's about keeping us separate from each other. And that's when we're most vulnerable. So ask for help. And if you do, you'll connect. Somewhere along the line, you'll connect with other people. Uh, Facebook, uh, you know, anything like that, where all of a sudden you'll, you'll see other people who think exactly like you, they're really friendly. And you build up a, a community of like-minded beings, you know, <laughs> like-minded thinkers. And eventually that passes off. And, you, and don't kid yourself. There's a lot of people who think like us. They may not express it, and they may not get on a radio show and talk about it, but there's a lot of people who are starting to think about things like this. And once you break the ice, you make them more comfortable. And But you got to have the crayons to do it. You know, you've got to just do it. Because if you don't, then you sit there in your little world, you're just going to uh, be alone and spiritually. You could be surrounded by people. I've been in rooms with a hundred people and felt alone <laughs> because I couldn't connect with any of them anymore, you know? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so that's the thing, you know. Break the ice. Get out there and... You know, lay it out, lay it to bear. If people laugh at you, they laugh. Look at, I look at David Icke, he's the perfect example. I mean, for 20 years, people treated David Icke like he was a friggin' moron, you know? He was saying things that people just uh, couldn't believe, you know? Now, all of a sudden, a lot of the things he said were came true, you know? All his research, all these naysayers, I listened to Jesse Ventura, which I, who I lost a lot of respect for lately. But Jesse Ventura uses all of David Icke's research, but we'll get him on a TV show and try to put him down and denigrate him about research into reptilians. You know, well, you that there's, there's just this whole battle thing that's going on in alternative media right now. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm caught in it in some small way as well as everybody else because there's so much fragmentation right now. Yeah. Yeah, well, what I think it is is a lot. Of, but we're back to ego, because yeah, yeah, we are. Everybody wants to be the guy, you know. Um, they want to be the person with all the answers, you know. I'm still learning. I mean, as a plumber uh, growing up, you know, people ask me, "How did you get, you know, to be a good plumber?" Right? Because I ask questions. I never assume I know anything. I could fix the same problem on a boiler a million times. If I come to your house and there's a problem, I'm going from step one till I get it fixed because I'm not assuming that it's going to be this. Because every time I assume, I'm wrong. So the thing is, don't have an ego because that's just, you know, asking for trouble. And, um, but everybody wants to be the guy. They want to be the guy with all the answers. You know, everybody has to come to me. I'm the guy with all the answers. You know? And nobody has all the answers. <laughs> so if you can't learn something new every day, then you're doing something wrong. You should be able to learn something new every day. Keep an open mind and uh, research, 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 you know? But you get into a guy like, that's what I found with the, uh, Jesse Ventura, was 
I saw that show with David Icke that he had at the beginning of the year, and I was like, that's it for me, you know? I mean, he, his whole intention was, and, and if you look at it, Jesse Ventura's team, he has that woman, uh, the black girl. Yeah, yeah. She, um, she has connections to um, the English royalty. She's in some kind of organization with them. Um, so it's almost like they talk, because he talks to the English royalty all the time. But you know what? David Icke was talking about child molestation and satanic ritual abuse in England 15 years ago when I read his book, The Biggest Secret. Well, it was 15, 20 years ago when I read The Biggest Secret. And he named Jimmy Seville as the person who's in charge of that. And what happened just this past six months? Jimmy Seville's all over the BBC and the uh, English papers as uh, participating in satanic ritual abuse for children. 430 cases. So David Icke wasn't crazy. <laughs> no, 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 no. The, and see, here's the problem. Nobody has all the truth, and everybody's right. fla fallible. And I have to remember that, you know, as well. A mm -hmm. lot of times, yes, there's disinfo out there. There's all kinds of people that are attempting to massage and manage the information. And we have to be aware of them, but we also have to honor the good information that comes to us by different mm -hmm. sources. Joe, I'm, gonna, I'm getting ready to bring Duncan and Miranda on. You're welcome to stay on the line with us. Um, but tell people about your book and where they can get it and how they can contact you. Okay. Uh, you can contact me on Facebook. It's Joe DiToma, D-I, capital T-O-M, as in Mary, A. Uh, the book, The Cult of the Black Sun, is, has its own page on Facebook, so you can leave a message there. You can message me on Facebook. You can find the book on Amazon. You can uh, request it at your local bookstore. They'll find it for you. If you want, contact me. I'll get you out the book. And there's um, links on the uh, .NET site right now where people are listening for right, Facebook okay. and for Amazon. Right. Um, and it's the link on the bottom that says The Cult of the Black Sun. Uh, you have that, the one book, uh, Black Sun Rising? Well, that's, no, actually that's, not, well, that's actually what I called the show tonight. That was oh, okay. Oh, I'm sorry, because there is a book, Black Sun. <laughs> no, no. You see, the whole uh, thing was reading your book and talking to you. Mm -hmm. I feel like right now the black sun is rising. And right. in the last couple of minutes here, is that what it feels like to you as well? I mean, really, things have gotten really dark, but at the same time, there is this kind of energy thing that's going on. So a lot of what you wrote in this book right now feels like all the birds have come home to roost. Right. Well, what's funny is that when I wrote the book, I sent a copy to Duncan. Mm -hmm. and wrote back to me and said, did you write this book about me? Because <laughs> <laughs> if you read the book, there's a whole faction about um, people battling the dark forces. Uh, and I said, well, no, but uh, you think it's about you? <laughs> we went back and forth, and there actually are a lot of similarities uh, in the book. Actually, Duncan and I have a lot of similarities, so he's a plumber also. <laughs> that's right, that's right. Right, right? right? Yep. So, yeah, we have a lot of, you know, everybody thinks, how come plumbers are so... Uh, Wacky, but you know why? And as a plumber, you cannot assume anything. Like I said before, when I go in people's houses, you can't assume. As a plumber, you have to use science. And in using science, sometimes you have to realize that there's also a spiritual side to science. Uh, and that's where we're at right now. We're at a dichotomy in our um, in our lifespan here, where yes, the dark darkness is rising, but there's a, a, also a light coming. And no one can actually figure it out, but everybody feels it, kind of, you know? Yep, the and energy is the all there. Yep. You know what, Joe? Uh, and you're going to stay on with us while we do uh, the next segment as well, but okay. I want to invite you to come back on again. Sure. Uh, I've enjoyed the conversation. You've made it really easy tonight. Um, and a lot of information, the chat rooms, I can tell they're getting into it as well. We're going to okay. take a brief break here and come back. And we're going to be joined by Duncan O'Finian and Miranda Kelly. Give us a couple of minutes here to get the calls patched in, and we'll do that when we come back on the other side of All Planet Radio.
Satanic cults have run this world for thousands of years. Human sacrifices have fueled their power over an unwitting population. A hand-picked team of patriotic agents and their influential backers have pitted themselves against this new world order to protect our country and our planet from their evil intentions. In the novel The Cult of the Black Sun by Joe DeToma, this struggle is told in the modern setting of present-day America. Buy it now at Amazon.com or your local bookstore. America. Buy it now at Amazon.com or your local bookstore.